so a warm welcome to this perhaps the last study class on the philosophy of hinduism the text uh, written by baba sahab ambedkar that we have been studying for last couple of uh, uh, weeks months and uh, as uh, we have seen that it's just a 92 pages uh, book or we can call it booklet but it is so dense with ideas that needs a lot of thinking as we have seen in our previous classes that it's not easy to decipher and understand but once we begin to see how baba sahab ambedkar's method of inquiry worked in examining the philosophy of hinduism we can see there are many aspects of the studies that branch out into the study of philosophy the sociology and the psychology of of this country and therefore i think uh, as uh, we are uh, looking at this wonderful text uh the uh, previous sections have been very clear that baba sahab ambedkar has examined the hinduism for its uh, norm and for its what is called the uh, utility and we have seen that the hinduism fail miserably in all those tests because it is the complete denial of justice and as expounded by dr baba sahab ambedkar justice is the uh, bundle of values of liberty equality and fraternity though he has not referred to the dignity here dignity of the individual but dignity was very much part of his scheme of uh, uh, understanding the society and we we see that for millions and millions of people hinduism stands for the denial of dignity so on all accounts as baba sahab ambedkar has inquired into the uh, philosophy of hinduism we have seen that on these two norms it has failed you know uh, severely and therefore uh you know this uh this book or this booklet which was not published when baba sahab ambedkar was alive but later on later on later on it was published and i think it's, it 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 still has a message for the people for this country to understand that you know this uh, justice uh, and democracy are counterpoints you know you cannot have democracy without justice and uh, therefore without liberty equality and fraternity we cannot have a democratic country and therefore we have to reexamine the tenets of uh, hinduism itself if we want to become a stronger country united country a democratic country so with this few words i would invite uh, shashank to read on the uh, remaining part and we will pause whenever required so shashank please over to you thank you so much sir I'll start. I admit that I have not taken the Upanish- Upanishads into account, but I have a reason, and I believe very good reason for doing so. I'm concerned with the philosophy of Hinduism as part of the philosophy of religion. I'm not concerned with the Hindu philosophy. If I was, it would have been unnecessary to examine the Upanishads. But I'm quite willing to deal with. it so as to leave no doubt that what i have shown to be the philosophy of hinduism is the philosophy of upanishads the philosophy of upanishads can be stated in a very few words it has been well summarized by books when he says that upanishad philosophy agreed in supposing the existence of permanent reality or substance beneath the shifting series of phenomena whether of matter or of mind the substance of the cosmos was brahma that of the individual man atma and the latter was separated from the former only if i may so speak by its phenomenal envelop by the casing of sensation thoughts and desires pleasures and pains which make up the illusory phantasmagoria of life this the ignorant take for reality their atma therefore remains eternally imprisoned in delusions bound by the fetters of desire and scourged by the whip of misery of what use is this philosophy of upanishads the philosophy of upanishads meant withdrawal struggle for existence by resort to ascetism and a destruction of desire by self mortification as a way of life it was condemned by the huxley in the scathing terms no more 
thorough mortification of the flesh has ever been attempted than that achieved by the Indian ascetic Ankrit. No later monarchism has so neatly, nearly succeeded in reducing the human mind to that condition of impassive, quasi somnambulism, which, but for its acknowledged holiness, might run the risk of being confounded with idiocy. But the condemnation of the philosophy of Upanishadas is nothing as compared to the denunciation of the same Lala Hardayal. The Upanishadas claim to expound that by knowing which everything is known, this quest for the absolute is the basis of all the spurious metaphysics of India. The treatises are full of absurd conceits, quaint fancies, and chaotic speculations. And we have not learned that they are worthless. We keep moving in the old rut. We edit and re-edit the old books. Instead of translating the classic of European social thought, what could Europe be if Frederick Harrison, Brooks, Babel, Anatole France, Harvey, Haeckel, Giddings, and Marshall should employ the time in composing treaties on Duns, Scottis, and Thomas Aquinas, and discussing the merits of the laws of Pentecius and the poetry of Beowulf? Indian pundits and graduates seem to suffer from a kind of a mania for what is effect and antiquated. Thus, an institution established by progressive men aims at leading our youths through Sanskrit grammar to the Vedas via the six darshanas. What a false move in the quest for wisdom. It is as if a Karawa should travel across the desert to the shores of the Dead Sea in the search of a fresh water. Young men of India, look not for the wisdom in the musty parchment of your metaphysical treatise. There is nothing but an endless round of verbal jugglery there. Read Rousey and Voltaire, Plato and Aristotle, Haeckel and Spencer, Marx and Tolstoy, Ruskin and Comte, and other European thinkers. If you wish to understand life and its problems. But denunciation apart, did the Upanishad philosophy have any influence on Hinduism as a social and political system? There is no doubt that it turned out to be the most ineffective and inconsequential piece of the speculation with no effect on the moral and social order of the Hindus. It may not be out of the place to inquire into the reason for this unfortunate reason. One reason is obvious. The philosophy of Upanishad remained incomplete and therefore did not yield the fruit which ought to have done. This will be quite clear if one asks what is the keynote of Upanishadas. In the words of Professor Max Muller, the keynote of the Upanishadas is know thyself. The know thy, the, thyself of the Upanishadas means know thy true self, that which underlies thine ego and find it and know it in the highest eternal self, the one without a second, which underlies the whole world. Okay. Uh, I think uh, this uh, inquiry as Baba Sambedkar has been stating that uh, before this, he has not inquired into the uh, philosophy of Upanishad. He has not looked at Upanishads. And uh, when he has not looked at Upanishads, he's saying that his, his concern is not to examine the Hindu philosophy, but philosophy of Hinduism as a part of philosophy of religion. So he's really trying to say that whether Hinduism falls under the category of religion. And uh, while he's doing it, uh, he is bringing up now the uh, examination of the philosophy of Upanishad. Because uh, you know, a lot of people claim that Upanishads have a very sublime and very, uh, you know, uh, very uh, human philosophy. And therefore, you know, Baba Sambedkar has looked at the philosophy of Upanishad. And here he brings in a very important figure in the history of thought in the world, uh, uh, the evolutionary uh, biologist whose name was Thomas Huxley, whom Baba Sambedkar has uh, read quite a lot. And uh, thus he was very much familiar with the thoughts of Huxley. And uh, in, in his book called Evolution and Ethics, 
Dr. Bawas Ambedkar has taken these uh, two paragraphs. And while uh, taking these two uh, paragraphs, he has, he, has, he has offered the condemnation by Huxley of Upanishad, where you know this is uh, it leads to the condition of impassive quasi somna embolism, which but for its acknowledged holiness might run the risk of being confounded with idiocy. So you see, any quest for certainty, any quest for permanence, any quest for absolute is going to lead, you know, the humanity to a lot of uh, problems. Because when we look at the word, this quest for certainty is ultimately gives rise to fundamentalism because there is nothing certain in the world. And if somebody tries to fix reality as Brahma in terms of never changing, uh, substance in terms of something which underlie every other thing in the world, you know, that kind of a philosophy doesn't work because the nature of the world is, uni you know, is evolutionary, it's constant change and the lack of uh, substantial essence. And therefore, you see this, this, this philosophy of, uh, of trying to reach out to something which is absolute is bound to fail and cause cause a lot of difficulties for the for the people and humanity and therefore i think this uh, this categorical rejection by huxley which baba sambedkar quoted here uh, in in terms of uh, looking at the philosophy of Upanishad is very apt and now when baba sambedkar moves on to uh, lala hardayal lala hardayal uh, was a renowned revolutionary of 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 of, of the cause for india's uh, independence from the British Raj and uh, he was somebody who he was a scholar who studied in America and founded he was one of the founder of, of founder of Gadar party and he has written a book on Bodhisattva ideal so this uncanny wise and intelligent man Lala Hardayal has denounced the uh, Upanishad as you know spurious metaphysics of India and this quest for the absolute is the basis of all the spurious metaphysics of India. And he says that the, 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 the books of Upanishads are full of conceits, quaint fancies, and chaotic speculations. So you see, this what in a way is trying to Lala Hardayal is trying to say that this is the false move in the quest for wisdom. And therefore, he's recommending that the young man in India should look at uh, you know, the great philosophers to learn, to understand about the life and its problems. So I think, I think look at, look at it from a point of view of the critical thinkers. We see the absurdity of the so-called Upanishadic philosophy here. And uh, then this, this paragraph, which was just read uh, about uh, uh, Professor Max Muller, uh, who claimed that the keynote of the Upanishad is know thyself. So knowing thyself is not about knowing your own mind. It's about knowing the true self, which is absolute, according to the Upanishadic philosophy, the Brahma itself. And therefore, you know, um, that's how the, uh, the, uh, the professor Max Muller summarizes the philosophy of Upanishads. So I think, I think you see now, Baba Zambedkar was examining the uh, philosophy of Hinduism from the ethical point of view, from social, political point of view. And now he's looking at the philosophy per se, philosophical point of view in terms of the metaphysics. And I think that's very important uh, way to look at uh, the philosophy of Hindu religion, uh, which is found in the Upanishads. So uh, that's the comment uh, till this section. If anybody would like to comment or, or offer any, anything, please do so. If not, then we will go proceed ahead. Okay, Shashank, please go on sure. reading further. Sure. That Atma and Brahma were one of the truth, the great truth which Upanishadas said they had discovered and they asked man to know this truth. See, the truth now, has been already discovered. That is the problem, you know. So it's, you know, the, the, the uh, people's mind should be free to inquire into the reality. We all mm -hmm. should know what is the reality, not that something should be already certain and already should be fixed for us. And that is the difference, you know, it, 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 it kills the free thinking, it, it kills the inquiry, the spirit of inquiry. Please go on. Yeah. 
Now, the reasons why the philosophy of Upanishads became ineffective are many. I will discuss them elsewhere. At this place, I will mention only one. The philosophers of Upanishads did not realize that to know truth was not enough. One must learn to love truth. The difference between philosophy and religion may be put in two ways. Philosophy is concerned with knowing truth. Religion is concerned with the love of truth. Philosophy is static. Religion is dynamic. These differences are merely two aspects of one and the same thing. Philosophy is static because it is concerned only with knowing truth. Religion is dynamic because it is concerned with the love of truth. As has been well said by Max Plowman, unless religion is dynamic and begets in us the emotion of love for something, then it is better to be without anything that we can call religion. For religion is perception of truth. And if our perception of truth is not accompanied by our love for it, then it were better not seen at all. The devil himself is one who has seen the truth only to hate it. The Tennyson said, we must love the highest when we see it. It does not follow. Seen in pure objectivity, the highest repels by its difference and the distance. What we fear it and what we fear we come to hate. This is the fate of all transcendental philosophies. They have no influence on the way of life. As Blake said, religion is politics and politics is brotherhood. Philosophy must become religion that it is must become a working ethic. It must not remain mere metaphysics. As Mr. Plowman says, if religion were a metaphysics and nothing else, one thing is certain, it would never be the concern of the simple and humble man. To keep it holy in the realm of metaphysics is to make nonsense of it. For belief in religion, as in something not directly and vitally effective of politics, is ultimately belief that is, strictly speaking, idiotic. Because in the effective sense, such a belief makes no difference. And in the world of time and space, what makes no difference does not exist. It is for these very reasons that the philosophy of Upanishads proved so ineffective. It is therefore incontrovertible that notwithstanding the Hindu code of ethics, notwithstanding the philosophy of Upanishads, not a little, not a jot did abate from the philosophy of Hinduism as propounded by the Manu. They were ineffective and powerless to erase the infamy preached by Manu in the name of religion. Notwithstanding their existence, one can still say, Hinduism, thy name is inequality. So that's how Baba Sahib Ambedkar in this particular section, Hinduism, thy name is inequality. And he has gone into a very important discussion here because, you know, you are, you are, this uh, philosophy of Upanishad might teach that everything is Brahma. Everything is Brahma. And, you know, of course, there are things like that in Gita that everybody has a, has a Brahma inside them or they are made up of Brahma. But this is, this is just a metaphysical thing. It has nothing to do with the ethics. And people don't love this metaphysical truth. If the Upanishad, Upanishadic or the Brahmanical philosophers have loved the truth that everything is equal, that everything is Brahma, then they, why they, they practice the caste system? Why they didn't oppose the laws of Manu, the code of ethics of Manu? So it's very clear that it's not enough to know something. It is enough to love the truth. And that love for the truth is completely absent as we have seen in this discussion that Baba Sambedkar had in this beautiful, beautiful uh, paragraphs where he quoted Flo, Man and Black. And you see this, this, this quote from Black is so pertinent. Religion is politics. And politics is brotherhood. Philosophy must become religion. That it is must it, it must become a working ethics. Where is the working ethics? If you have a metaphysics which, which says that everybody is made up of the Brahma, then from that metaphysics, your working ethics at least should promote equality. At least should promote the dignity of the individuals because it, it follows from the same metaphysical logic that you have been advocating in terms of 
of of Upanishads. You know these philosophers which has gone ahead like Shankara or or Kumarila, but they talk big things. But when it comes to caste system, they are the casteist. Then we can imagine what use of such a philosophy if the people are casteist, if the people do not love the very truth that they claim that they know of that everything is Brahma. So I think this is a very very a uh, deep deep sort of a paragraph that we have encountered just now and if we think through it very clearly we can see that even the so called philosophy of hinduism is is a, is a complete failure a total fiasco when it comes to the human dignity when it comes to the equality when it comes to cherishing humanity there is no brotherhood there is no uh, working ethics that can that can that derives from the metaphysical uh, you know the speculations i would say of the so called Brahmanical or Upanishadic philosophy. So Baba Sahib Ambedkar summarized in one word, Hinduism, thy name is inequality. You cannot separate Hinduism for in, from inequality. These are both are the same things. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you remove the caste system from this Hinduism, Hinduism dies, you know, because the caste is the breath of Hinduism. So let's go on further if there is no other comment. or if anybody would like to comment we can we can we can uh, take a pause and listen but if not then we let's move ahead with reading further okay okay sure sure i'll begin inequality is the soul of hinduism the morality of hinduism is only social it is unmoral and unhuman to say the least what is unmoral and unhuman easily becomes immoral inhuman and infamous okay let's take a pause because these words are very important yep. because you know the morality of hinduism is only social okay it is unmoral and unhuman to say the least so because inequality is the soul of hinduism and its philosophy is is unmoral and unhuman because it has nothing to do with the human beings just the realization of somebody as uh, some abstract thing then what is unmoral and what is unhuman easily becomes immoral inhuman and infamous that's a very important thing that if something lacks humanness it tends to become immoral inhuman and infamous very potent you know line that baba sambedkar has put it here go on right this is what hinduism has become those who doubt this or deny this proposition should examine the social composition of the hindu society and ponder over the condition of some of the elements in it take the following cases first as to the primitive tribes in what state of civilization are they the history of human civilization include the entire period of human progress from savagery to barbarism and from barbarism to civilization the transition from one to other has been marked by some discovery or intention in some department of knowledge of art resulting in advancing the onward march of man the development of articulate speech was the first thing which formed the point of view of human progress divided man from the brute it marks the first stage of savagery the middle period of the state of the savagery began with the knowledge of the manufacture and use of fire this wonderful discovery enabled man to extend his habit almost indefinitely he could leave his forest home go to different and colder climates and increase his food supply by including flesh and fish the next discovery was the bow and arrow this was the greatest achievement of the primitive man and marks the highest state of savage man it was indeed a wonderful implement the possessor of this device could bring down the fleetest animal and could defend himself against the most predatory the transition from savagery to barbarism was marked by the discovery of pottery hitherto man had no utensils that could withstand the action of fire without utensils man could not store nor could could he cook undoubtedly pottery was a great civilizing influence the middle state of barbarism began when man learned to domesticate wild animals man learned that captive animals could be of service to him man now become a herdsman 
no longer dependent on food upon precarious chests of wild animals. Milk procurable at all seasons made a highly important addition to his dietary. With the aid horse and camel, he travels wide areas hitherto impassable. The captive animals became aids to com commerce, which resulted in the dissemination of commodities as well as of, of ideas. The next discovery was of the art of a smelting iron. This marks the highest stage of advancement of barbaric man. With this discovery, man became a tool making animal who with his tool could fashion wood and stone and build houses and bridges. This marks the close of the advancement made by barbaric man. The dividing line which marks off barbaric people from civilized people in the fullest sense of the word civilization is the art of making ideas tangible by means of graphic signs, which is called the art of writing. With this, man conquered time as he had with the earlier invention conquered space. He could now record his deeds and his thoughts. Henceforth, his knowledge, his poetical dreams, his moral aspirations might be recorded in such form as to read not merely by his contemporaries, but by a successive generation of remote posterity. For man, his history becomes safe and secure. This was the steepest ascent, and the climbing of it marks the beginning of civilization. We will take a pause here. I think this uh, one page is a complete history of human beings. You know, how the humanity began from, uh, you know, the invention of language to advancing to the use of fire, then uh, making bow and arrow, then pottery then domestication of animals, iron, smelting of iron, then tool making, and then ultimately the art of writing. And this art of writing, you know, is a kind of uh, 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 an element of civilization. And I think in, in a nutshell, Baba Sambedkar has given the history of humankind, starting from, uh, you know, uh, able to learn, speak in language, to the art of writing, the, the abstract science, that's that were produced by human beings. For example, only 26 abstract signs in, in English can express so many things. Whatever we are we are reading today or whatever we have been reading, it's just the uh, permutation and combination of 26 orthographic symbols. And therefore, I think uh, uh, this 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 history, short history of humanity that Baba Sambedkar sketched about uh, the 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 the, the uh, human beings is so important. It can it can become a kind of a guide to even understand the historicity of the human civilization. So go on. Sure. Stopping here for the moment, let us ask, in what state of civilization are the primitive tribes? The name primitive tribes is expressive of the present state of the people who are called by that name. They live in small scattered huts in forest. They live on wild fruits, nuts, and roots. Fishing and hunting are also resorted to for the purpose of securing food. Agriculture plays a very small part in their social economy. Food supplies being extremely precarious, they lead a life of semi-starvation from which there is no escape. As to close, they economize them to a vanishing point. They move almost in a state of complete nakedness. There is a tribe which is known as the Bonda Porajas, which means naked Porajas. Of these people, it is said that the women wear a very narrow strip, which serves as a petticoat, almost identical with what is worn by the Momjok Nagas in the Assam. The ends hardly meeting at the top on the left thigh. These petticoats are woven at home out of the fiber of a forest tree. Girls wear a fillet of beds and of palmyra leaf and an enormous quantity of beds and neck ornaments, extremely like those worn by many Komja women. Otherwise, the women wear nothing. The women shave their heads entirely. 
of these chenches a tribe residing near farhabad in the nizam's dominions it is said that their houses are conical rather slight in structure made of bamboos sloping to the central point and covered with a thinnish layer of thatch they have very little indeed in the way of material effects the scanty clothes they wear consisting of langoli and a cloth in the case of a man and a short bodies and a petticoat in the case of woman being practically all besides a few cooking pots and a basket or two which perhaps sometimes contain grain they keep cattle and goats and in they keep cattle and goats and in this particular village do a little cultivation elsewhere subsisting on honey and forest produce which they sell regarding the moriyas another primitive tribe it is stated the men generally wear a single cloth rounding the waist with a slap coming down in the front they also have a necklace of beads and when they dance put on cock's plumes and peacock's feathers in their turbans many girls are profusely tattooed especially on their faces and some of them on their legs as well the type of tattooing is said to be according to the test of the individual and it is done with the thorns and needles in their hair many of them stick the feathers of jungle cocks and their heads are also adorned with the combs of wood and tin and brass this primitive tribes have no hesitation about eating anything even worms and insects and in fact there is very little meat that they will not eat whether animal has died a natural death or has been killed four days or more before by tiger You see, that is the condition of the primitive tribes in this country. Absolutely. So that is the point that Baba Zambedkar is making. That what kind of a society that has been produced by, you know, the so-called philosophies of Hinduism. Okay, we move on to next. Yep. The criminal tribes lives not in the forests as the primitive tribes do, but in the plains in the close proximity too, and often in the midst of civilized life. Holiest and the criminal tribes of the United Provinces gives an account of their activities. They live entirely by crime. A few may be ostensibly engaged in agriculture, but this is only to cover up their real activities. Their nefarious practices find largest scope in decoity or robbery by violence. But being a community organized for crime, nothing comes amiss to them. on deciding to commit a decoity in any particular locality spies are sent out to select a suitable victim study the general habits of villages and the distance from any effective aid and enumerate the number of men and firearms the raid usually takes place at midnight acting on the information given the, by the spies men are posted at various points in the village and by firing off their guns attract attention from the main gang which attacks the particular house or houses previously appointed the gang usually consists of 30 to 40 men it is essential to emphasize the great part played by crime in the general life of these peoples a boy is initiated into crime as soon as he is able to walk and talk no doubt the motive is practical to a great extent in so far as it is always better to risk a child in the petty theft who if he is caught would probably be cuffed while an adult will immediately be arrested an important part is also played by women who although they do not participate in actual raids have many heavy responsibilities besides being clever in disposing of stolen property the women of the criminal tribes are experts in shop lifting At one time, the criminal tribes included such well-organized confederacies of professional criminals as the Pindaris and the Thugs. The Pindaris were a predatory body of armed gangsters. Their organization was an open military organization of freebooters who could muster twenty thousand fine horse and even more. They were under the command of brigand chiefs. Chitu, one of the most powerful commanders, had under his single command ten thousand horse, including five thousand good.
cavalry besides infantry and guns the pindaris had no military projects for employing their loose bands of irregular soldiery which had developed into bodies of professional plunderers the pindaris aimed at no conquest their object was to secure booty and cash for themselves the general loot and rapine was their occupation they recognized no rulers they were subjects of none they rendered loyalty to none they respected none and plundered all high and low rich and poor without fear or compunction the turks were a well organized body of professional assassins who in gangs of from 10 to 100 wandered in various gusses throughout india worked themselves into confidence of wayfarers of their wealthier class and when a favorable opportunity occurred strangle them by throwing a handkerchief or a noose round their necks and then plundered and buried them all this was done according to certain ancient and rigidly prescribed forms after the performance of special religious rites in which was the consecration of the package and the sacrifice of sugar they were staunch worshipper of kali the hindu goddess of destruction the assassination of for gain was with them a religious duty and was considered a holy and honorable profession they had in fact no idea of doing wrong and their moral feelings did not come into play the will of the goddess by whose command and in whose honor they followed their calling was revealed to them through a very complicated system of omens in obedience to this they often travel in even the distance of 100 miles in company with or in the wake of their intended victims before a safe opportunity had presented itself for executing their design and when the deed was done rites were performed in honor of that tutelary deity and a goodly portion of the spoil was set apart from her for her the thugs had also a jargon of their own as well as a certain signs by which members recognize each other in the remotest part of the india even those who from age or infirmities could no longer take an active part in the operation used to air the cause as watchmen spies or dressers of food it was owing to their thorough organization the secrecy and the security with which they went to work but chiefly to the religious crap in which they shrouded their murders that they could continue for centuries to practice their craft the extraordinary fact was that thagi was regarded as a regular profession by indian rulers of the day both hindu and mohammedans the thugs paid taxes to the state and state left them unmolested you are muted sir uh, we can take a pause here because i think uh, this this paragraphs indicate that what kind of uh, the society that was produced by the so called metaphysics and the metaphysics of the upanishads didn't go hand in hand with the working ethics for the society and as baba sambedkar has given the uh, small sketch of the human history starting from the uh, uh, innovation of uh, invention of language use of fire and to grow uh, an arrow pottery the domestication of animals iron tool making animal to art of writing so this civilizing force of uh, art of writing or to think through has been not promoted and as a result we have seen that in india we have seen as baba sambedkar has noted here the primitive tribes and the way baba sambedkar has described the situation of the primitive tribe is really very horrible and one can think about how such a class of people can 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 live can remain in the civilized society and the same with the criminal tribes the way baba sambedkar has, has has talked about the criminal tribes we can understand the severity of 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 the communities in terms of uh, uh, you know what happened to them and he talked about the pindaris he talked about thugs and so on and so forth so we we begin to see that the philosophy that talks about uh, you know the 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 lofty ideas like the all earth is one family what happened to their own people talks about uh, you know brahma being present in everybody even the animals and plants and what not what happened to the human beings in this in this very 
land where these philosophies are practiced. So you see, like a, a well prepared advocate, Baba Sambedkar has launched his inquiry into philosophy of Hinduism, and he is pointing out to this, 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 this facts of the Indian society where the people are treated like people are forced to live the life of a theory of of the quality of 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 plundering the wealth of other people and live in uh, in a totally uncivilized state of life so i think that's that's very important the way baba sambedkar is now trying to end this section on philosophy of religion particularly philosophy of hinduism in terms of the concrete examples of the society it produced so go on unless there is any comment by anybody Shashank? Okay, so if there is no comment, I will go on. Because this is all self-explanatory, it is descriptive. The analytical Absolutely. part is over because Baba Sambedkar has proved the case that Hinduism, thy name is inequality. And he has proved his case that he doesn't withstand the norm of justice, not it is useful for the human communities. And now he's giving the practical result that, pro that has been produced by this philosophy. So let's right. go on. It was not until the British became rulers of the country that an attempt was made to suppress the Turks. By 1835, 382 Turks were hanged and 986 were transported or imprisoned for life. Even as late as 1879, the number of registered Turks was 344. And the Thuggy and the Dacoity Department of the Government of India continued to exist until 1904. When it's place was taken by the Central Criminal Intelligence Department. Mm. While it is not possible for the criminal tribes to live by mm. organized bodies of criminals, mm. crime continues to be their main mm. occupation. Mm. Besides these two classes, there is a third class mm. which comprises a body of people who are known as untouchables. Below the untouchables, there are others who are known as unapproachables. Untouchables are those who cause pollution only if they touch. The unapproachables are those who cause pollution if they come within a certain distance. It is said of the Nayadis, a people who fall into the category of unapproachables, that they are the lowest caste among the Hindus. The dog eaters, they are the most persistent in their clamor for charity and will follow at a respectful distance. For miles together, any person walking, driving, or boating. If anything is given to them, it must be laid down. And after the prison offering it, it has proceeded a sufficient distance. The recipient comes timidly forward and removes it. Of the same people, Mr. Thurston says, the subject Nayadis, whom I examined and measured as Shoranese, though living only about three miles off had by reason of the pollution which they traditionally carry with them to avoid walking over the long bridge which spans the river and follow a circuitous route of many miles. Below the unapproachables are unseeables. In the Tenevali district of the Madras presidency, there is a class of unseeables called Purada Vannanats. Of them, it is said that they are not allowed to come out during the daytime because their sight is enough to cause pollution. These unfortunate people are compelled to follow the nocturnal habits, leaving their dens after dark and scuttling home at the false dawn like the badger, the hyena, the award walk. Consider the total population of these classes. The primitive tribes form a total of 25 million souls. The criminal tribe number four and a half millions and untouchables number 50 millions. This makes a grand total of 17 and a half millions. Now ask how these people could have remained in the state of moral, material, social and spiritual degradation surrounded as they have been by Hinduism. Hindus say that the civilization is older than any civilization that Hinduism as a religion is superior to any other religion. If this is how it's that Hinduism failed to elevate these people, bring them enlightenment and hope. How is that it failed to even to reclaim them? How is that it stood with folded hands when millions and millions were taken to life to shame and crime? 
what is the answer to this the only answer is that hinduism is overwhelmed with the fear of pollution it has not got the power to purify it has not the impulse to serve and that is because by its very nature it is unhuman and unmoral it is a misnomer to call it religion its philosophy is opposed to very thing for it, which religion stands okay i think uh, this is a very fundamental sort of the uh, discussion that uh, we can we have had in this particular book philosophy of of hinduism and uh, like a very well articulated piece that baba sambedkar has built up his case and ultimately he has proved that hinduism is not even qualified to be called a religion because it is basically you know unhuman and unmoral you see this this critique is very severe the way baba saheb ambedkar has criticized hinduism is very severe but his severity of criticism has not is not coming out from his anger or is not coming out because you know he dislikes something it is coming out of his concern for humanity and he is proving us that the so called hinduism they claim that hinduism is the oldest religion in the world and it's the best religion in the world what it has done for this 75 million people and from today's uh, standard if we see you know what happened to the 30% of the indian population where it is and if we take into consideration the condition of the shudras or the obcs what so called hinduism has done to them nothing no political rights no civil rights the life of poverty the life of insult the life of violence and what not so you see this 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 way we can we can begin to see the analytical mind of baba saheb ambedkar and uh, that's why there is a beauty of studying the uh, books like uh, philosophy of religion hinduism it is just 92 pages but in 92 pages one can learn the entire you know history of civilization one can learn about philosophy one can le- learn about religion one can learn about hinduism one can learn about the different values one can learn about philosophies of other people and so on and so forth so that's what is the beauty of 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 studying i would say the uh, writing and speeches of baba saheb ambedkar and i think that is it as we conclude the reading of philosophy of hinduism today and uh, i know that that uh, the, the the reading of baba saheb's book doesn't yield you know in one reading we have to go on reading again and again the way we are doing it here in in terms of the communal reading that we begin to see the various aspects of 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 the ideas that baba saheb ambedkar has propounded in 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 this in this in this in this particular booklet so uh, anything anything anybody would like to comment on because this is the last class on philosophy of hinduism and anything uh, that we studied before that anybody would like to comment upon anything that any would like anybody would like to say uh if may i know the current situation of the unapproachable and the unseeable today okay i think uh, there is there is still that uh, caste of uh, unseeable in in tamil nadu i think uh, there is one uh, producer a director made a movie on them recently uh, lina mani meklai and uh, she she has uh, depicted their life and and still they do exist in tamil nadu and uh, they they have they are they are like nocturnal sort of uh, communities they they come out in the night they live the life of unseeable even today though some of some of the condition has changed and i i i heard that they have difficulties in getting even the caste certificate and so on and so forth and of course there was the uh, community of unapproachables as baba sambedkar has as 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 talked about in 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 kerala there where there was a community which was also unseeable and unapproachable even 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 if you look at uh, what happened during the peshwa regime in maharashtra in pune they were the the untouchables were not just untouchables but were also unapproachables the shadow of the untouchable will will cause pollution and that will cause a lot of uh, problems with 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 the untouchables so there is still that community existing in in tamil nadu basically for india south part is well educated they say 
the education policies are higher there. And then too, uh, you mentioned about Tamil Nadu and Kerala. It's so surprising these traditions are still carried forward after getting freedom also. Right, right. Today, man, men and women are suffering from it. Right, right, right. right. Mm -hmm. Anybody, anything? Anything from Mahasenji? If there is nothing, because I think this part is very self-explanatory, it's not much analytical except the part regarding the Upanishadic philosophy. The rest of uh, the, the, the part yes, is very descriptive. Yes. No, yeah, no, you can proceed further. No, that's what I'm saying. You know, there is a descriptive part at the end of it. And uh, analytical part was over except a few paragraphs that we studied today. And I recommend all of you to go back to the text again and again because there is so much to be learned from these 92 pages. Yes, Shashank. Yes, sir. I think uh, from this philosophy, there is one beautiful line I clicked uh, really wonderful in this session that, you know, we should not, you know, only see the truth. We need to love the truth. Mm -hmm. And that is like moral aspects that, you know, we need to love the truth. We need to, you know, uh, apply the truth and we need to reach for the truth. And then it becomes part of our life. And that is that is one uh, particular uh, uh, line I really clicks. And then uh, last session, we had a great discussion on the reflective morality. Uh, so I think philosophy of Hinduism, when Baba Sahib you know, examines and questions and then gives analysis, and there is no such morality in any, any sort of a morality, but, and then he analyzed based on three aspects and conduct based on your, um, uh, based on uh, your personal instincts, con conducts based on your social instincts, conduct based on your um, national instincts. How is that morality? You know, so how we can have the reflective morality? So that is the crux, uh, and that is the essence part of that. You know, uh, then, then uh, at, at the last, that Baba Sahib is really finished in a beautiful line. That you know, yes, it's it is Hinduism is totally unmoral and unhuman, and then we as Ambedkarite Buddhists are really living a, a really a moral life and a human life and a very dignified life. And, and, and we are like a privilege and we are like, you know, very proud that, you know, we are living a great, uh, wonderful life in today's 21st century, you know? Yeah. Uh, in, yeah. Yeah. I think the, the philosophy uh, in its uh, etymological sense means love for the truth. So yes. when we talk about the love for the truth uh, as philosophy, because there is no love for the truth, only abstraction and uh, talking about abstract ideas, uh, that can be one ground to even denounce uh, Hinduism uh, as a philosophy itself, because it's not love for the truth. And uh, other ways, Baba Sambedkar has already denounced that Hinduism is not even a religion, because it's, as you said, unhuman and unmoral. You see this, uh, also the, the texts uh, that Baba Sambedkar wrote, the books that Baba Sambedkar wrote has beautiful words. Like these words like unmoral and unhuman. We have heard the uh, word inhuman, but unhuman, even not human. There is no humanness in those philosophies. There is no moralness in those philosophies. It is so abstract. Okay, then I think uh, there are a few points uh, on my mind from many days. If uh, we can take up that, uh, it's about the reservation policies. On the one hand, we I think, uh, uh, Richa, madam, this uh, please stick to the topic of uh, this uh, uh, today's yeah, class. Uh, before coming to the class uh, with the title of philosophy of Hinduism, I had my mindset that why we are reading this and what is the motto behind reading this. But after attending today's class, many things have been clear as you have pointed out that uh, it is not only about the philosophy of Hinduism, but the moral values and whatever you know, important and valuable insights we have got. Uh, it serves humanity. And Baba said the way he has uh, written uh, this 
particular paper philosophy of Hinduism in 90 pages uh, as a as a student or as a researcher, one may take many insights and uh, there is much learning on the writing style. And uh, this, is, this is not only limited to Hinduism, but it has widened the scope of entire evolution good, of good. Uh, evolution of mankind, uh, uh, human, and uh, he has covered all the aspects uh, which were uh, still applicable at that time. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for uh, choosing this uh, book and wonderful, reading session. Wonderful, Richa. That was a wonderful comment because it, it really transcends the mere uh, the, uh, discussion on the philosophy of Hinduism, but it touches, as you said, the points about the human progress, human development, as uh, Shashank was referring to reflective morality and, you know, the, the particular discussion on evolution and ethics and whatnot. So, you know, it's you're right. It has all those beautiful elements in built in there. And, you know, the more we read it, the more we understand it, the more we begin to see the brilliance of the mind of Baba Sambedkar, the power of his writings, the power of his thinking to articulate what is very difficult to articulate. Actually, generally, uh, previous section, I think uh, it was so mainly focusing on Manu because he is the sole uh, creator of Hinduism philosophies and it's very heart-wrenching. So, and uh, as we have done the Manu's Madness project also, so we got to, got to know how emotionally draining uh, the sayings of uh, Mad Manu are. So that's why it was uh, like my mindset was like that. Good. Why we are uh, studying the philosophy of Hinduism. It's not, and many people think that it's not serving uh, studying of these particular uh, philosophies and we need to be uh, present to them discuss the points which pertains today. Okay. So this mindset many people have here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think uh, that was a wonderful session we had today and uh, we have been uh, uh, reading this philosophy of Hinduism for a long time and I, I reckon that a lot of people uh, watch our recorded uh, study sessions and they benefit a lot from it. I got some personal comments from them and I think uh, uh, today we finished the reading of the book. Uh, I will compile all the classes and share with you all. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, this joint study of Baba Sahib's writing and speeches. We will think about uh, the topics in our group. Thank you so much. Jai Bhim Namo Buddha. Jai Bhim Mangeshwari. Thank you. Jai Bhim no, no, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. It's, it's great, great work. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank Let's, you, Jai. Thank you, thank you, bye, Jai.